folks, this is Vince Cotera. He has an MFA in poetry from Indiana University, Bloomington, um, where he went to school with me. Um, and uh, uh, he was born in San Francisco, correct? And, it, and is a Filipino American poet. And um, I'm gonna let you tell, tell the rest, but. Oh, okay. Ready? Yeah. Ready. Hi, everyone. Uh, Hi. Hello. <laughs> I'm uh, sitting in my office in uh, Waterloo, Iowa, and I have uh, taught here at the University of Northern Iowa for, gosh, not quite 30 years, but, but pretty close uh, to that. And I'll read a few poems here uh, from my, my different books. I've, I've published four uh, collections of poetry and um <clears throat> so this was the first one no that's not the first one this was the first one can you guys see that that's the cover can you see that on the screen now they can yes okay all right so that's uh that's the cover uh of my book dragonfly that came out in 1994. And I wanted to read a poem from it called After the Gig, St. Agnes Teen Club Dance. And I'm I'm gonna dedicate this to my uh to my friend Ronnie, who I had lunch with. I was in San Francisco um this past week, and Ronnie and I had, had lunch, and we probably hadn't seen each other in 40 years, something like that. And we were in a band together back in, in high school. And so this song um, is about that. And it, this song would have been set, or the, the poem rather would have been set around 1967, maybe. Uh, and so the Vietnam War was on at the time. And of course there was a draft at that time. And so all of us, uh, that was a you know part of our lives. So after the gig, St. Agnes Teen Club Dance. Crisp air, main lines in the brain. And I love the guitar cases heft in my hand, the strings of my SG, that's a guitar, the strings of my SG muted now by velvet. No groupies, says Ron, as he did every Saturday night, and we smile, the joke fitting like old high tops. I feel again the sweet exhaustion, fingertips sore and ridged by taut steel, a hoarse voice till Sunday night. In the cold air, as always, I first noticed the, the amps ringing deep in my head, whirlpooling down where the band is always playing Soul Sacrifice. Ron's wicked grin as he shuttles the conga beat across the skitter of Terry's sticks. Steve's hands freckled, walking a Vox bass. And above their safety net, J and I trapeze, his wheeling solos on the Hammond B3 me on my SG custom. The hall always filled with a fog of sound, rock and roll mixed with the sweat of dancers, the pale ennui of wallflowers loving the edges. In the night air, too keyed up for sleep, we pull into a doggy diner for a quick cup of coffee. No one says a word. There's graduation and the draft, the world like a Leslie speaker's double horns, whirling, whirling. So the, that poem is about that sort of feeling, you know, when of, of being in high school and then thinking that, that we could all be sent to Vietnam at some point, you know, and, uh, and how that was always sort of hovering in the background. Um, and the, the Leslie, that refers to an organ speaker that, that looked like this, you know, two, two horns uh, that, that would then whirl and make that organ sound. And, um, um, so the line is, there's graduation in the draft, the world, like a Leslie speaker's double horns whirling, whirling. Um, yeah, so that's my friend Ron that I, that's mentioned in the poem, uh, and I had lunch with him, uh, when was that Friday? So just, just a week ago today. Um, so that's the, a poem from the book Dragonfly. Um, my, my second collection was called Ghost Wars, and that's the cover of that. And 
that was a book that was um, that came from that was sort of a a reaction to the beginning of the Iraq War, and so sort of an anti-war poem. Um, I'm going to read a poem in it called Halloween 1963, which is a uh, poem um, <clears throat> um, that is set at the time that um, the U.S. was just getting into the Vietnam War. The first uh, landing of troops in Vietnam was in 1963. Uh, Marines were sent to Vietnam. We had been there with advisors uh, uh, before that time, but that was the first time that troops were actually sent. Um, uh, units were actually sent. Um, so this has to do again with being a kid. I was 11 in 1963. And there are mentions in the poem of, uh, for those of you who may not know, uh, France uh, was involved in a war in Vietnam before we were. Uh, and the war, France's war ended and then ours ramped up. And a um, um, little bit of a warning, there's a, there's a men mention at the end of, 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 a, of an, uh, a war event. Um, not too bad. All right, Halloween, 1963. Um, uh, Ricky Chang swept Edgewood Lane with his Johnny 7 assault rifle. So that's a toy. Uh, single shot, rapid fire, grenade launcher. Let me start over. Ricky Chang swept Edgewood Lane with his Johnny 7 assault rifle. Single shot, rapid fire, grenade launcher, bazooka, breakaway pistol, and who can remember what else? In khakis and bush hat, little Frank Asahi was a desert rat, brandishing his M1 carbine with its plastic wood grain stock. I had on old fatigues, lovingly daubed with brown, black, yellow, green. An olive drab submachine gun, just like Vic Morrow's on combat. We patrolled San Francisco streets, Victorians perched on steep hills. Our rucksacks bulged with Tootsie Rolls, chunk, Chunkies, black and orange kernels of candy corn, Pippin apples. At Edgewood Lane's dead end, a house with windows shuttered like dark eyes. We chorused, trick or treat. The young woman at the door said, I'm from France, I'm sorry, I don't have any candy, until her hand fluttered like a white wing to her mouth. She whispered, not to us, Dien bien fou. We must have thought she was speaking French, maybe even giggled as she lurched like a spastic marionette back through the open door and froze in front of the living room window, a stature. That's okay, lady, we yelled, and tumbled down her steps in a clatter of bandoliers and plastic straps, whooping like movie Indians. At that very moment, a Green Beret advisor was pinned down in a firefight at the edge of a Montagnard village, his tribesmen firing scalpel bursts into green jungle. At that moment, President ZM's generals were braiding an iron lariat around his palace, a noose of tanks and machine guns for Saigon's Mandarin, the morning sun like a blind eye. But my mind keeps circling back to that woman. I later heard her name, Jacqueline Dubois, Nine years before, a French paratrooper, her father, had thrown himself on a Viet Minh grenade, saving his squad just three hours before the French surrender. I see her now, poised at the window, her face in white dress barred by the half-open blinds. She sees the white flash, Asian faces, just boys really, surging over the redoubt, a monsoon of hot metal, the sickly sweet stench of burning flesh a mist of blood on the breeze. Her window faces east, and as she stands there, she cannot see the amber fields rolling away into the night where America's sleeping children dream on the edge of history. So that poem is about all of these events that were happening, that of course, as kids, you know, out trick-or-treating, we didn't have any idea about all of that that was happening in Vietnam at the time. Dien Bien Phu, was the location 
of the last French uh, battle uh, in Vietnam. And it was a, a defeat. And uh, and so <clears throat> I had this idea that this this uh, woman, this actually happened. We were we were I don't know if it was 1963, but I remember being uh, trick or treating with my friends and we knocked it on the door and then it was a woman and she said that she didn't know anything about Halloween, you know, that she was uh, not from, the, you know, she was from France. And then I came up with this idea of using that for this poem of uh, of a woman whose father had been the last person killed in the French war in Vietnam. And in uh, the way that then she sees us, you know, we were we were Asian American kids, you know, she, you know carrying weapons because we were our costumes were military. Right. And so she she has this uh, this um, this uh, flash of, of memory. Right. That happens because of that. Um, and of course, uh, the, the, the poem ends where America's sleeping children dream on the edge of history. You know, we are kids, you know, we American kids didn't know what was ahead of us, you know, with the Vietnam War. Hey, Diane, I, I think I wrote those two poems when we were in class together. It sounds Maybe. Yeah, it's, it's been a few minutes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that was uh, quite a few years ago, actually. I won't say how long, but. Yeah. All right. Then I, I uh, let me bring up another um, another cover. So this is my third uh, collection of poems, "Fighting Kite," um, and this "Fighting Kite" is a uh, is a biography in poems about my dad, who uh, who fought in World War Two, and. Uh, and so the, I'll read the the um, the poem that that's called Fighting Kite. The book is called Fighting Kite, but there's a poem in it called Fighting Kite, and it's about my father uh, as a as a child um, uh, playing with fighting kites, flying flying fighting kites. And the fighting kites were. This is something that's done all over, all over the the all over Asia and also uh, the Mid East. Uh, some of you may have read uh, the book. Um, oh, I've forgotten the name of it. Um, I, anyway, <laughs> the book. Uh, it's a book, a pretty famous book about about uh, about uh, fighting kites. Um, kite kite fighter maybe it's called anyway um so what what kids would do is um they would put razors on the kite uh, you know uh, embed razors into the kite uh, and also um glue broken glass onto the string right so that that their string could cut the other person's string you know or their or the razors on the on the kite could cut the other. So it was it was a battle, right, uh, with kites. Um, and my father did that as a kid, you know. And and I always thought that was sort of weirdly romantic, right, in a way. And uh, um, and my father, I remember my father uh, uh, trying to teach me to fly kites when I was a kid, and I was just terrible at it. I could not keep them in the air, and. The cover of the of the book there that you can see, um, I don't know how well would it help if I do this. Yeah, so that's me, in I don't know what year, that that boy, my son, my 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 uh, my fifth uh, child, uh, he's like three or four there, and he's twenty two now. So it's been, you know, this was eighteen years ago probably, and I'm trying to teach him to fly a kite, you know, and and. It wasn't working, you know, he, he was holding the string and I was going, run, run, you know, and he just stood there and looked at me. Uh, so anyway, uh, my son and I were not great kite flyers, but my dad was a champion fight kite flyer. And in fact, you know, did the fighting kite thing. Uh, the, po the poem is divided into two parts. Um, um, the first part is titled 1930. So this happens uh, when my father is nine years old. 
and he's uh, flying fighting kites. And then, then the second section is in 1989, which is when, when my father passed away. Um, what do I need to tell you? There's a mention of the tinikling, which is a Philippine dance that uh, you may have seen where they, they, they dance with, with bamboo poles that are on the ground and, you know, they clack them together and people dance in and out of them. Um, and um, what else? Uh, there's a mention of, of Pasig, which is the river. That Pasig is the town that my father lived in. And through, through Pasig uh, uh, flowed the, the, uh, the Pasig River. And um, there's also a mention of Corregidor, which is an island in Manila Bay where the Philippine and American troops who were fighting the Japanese in World War II, they retreated across the Philippines and ended up trapped on Corregidor Island where they were eventually, uh, you know, eventually the, the US and Philippine uh, um, forces surrendered at that time. So that was an important, uh, important uh, location for my dad. All right, fighting kite, 1930. Just outside Manila, it was my father's ninth birthday, but all he could think about was his duel with fighting kite that afternoon. For weeks, he'd been grinding glass between rocks, green for luck. The kite string soaked in glue, then dipped in powdered glass. In the sun, the string would gleam, filament of emerald. His kite emblazoned with a vermilion hawk. Talons of shiny hooks and razors hammered from tin can lids. At 3 p.m. sharp, his hawk dancing a red tinikling in the sun. My father stood by the Pasig River, his 12-year-old opponent on the other bank, the wind blowing downstream. In the sky, the other kite was a silver mantis with bat wings. The hawk and mantis swiveled and faked like mongoose and cobra. My father gauged the wind like a cat's paw on his cheek, waiting for the breeze to hold its breath. Then the whiplash crack of his wrist. Hawk whirled around mantis, razors flashing, kite strings twining, sliced. The bat wings ripped away in tatters, He'd won. My father had won. 1989. Swimming in that white hospital bed, IVs like kite strings, <clears throat> IVs like kite strings in reverse, piercing his arms. Papa must have longed to soar, to leave behind his sick and scarred heart, his breath trapped in emphysemic lungs. Oh, to fly like some red feathered bird to dance free in lucid air above the sparkling Pasig. How far then you could see the jungle green rock of Corregidor leaping from Manila Bay, the Pacific stretched flat out, an aquamarine mirror, endless and new. The razors of Papa's soul slashed at his lines, invisible strings tethered deep in the ground. Then Papa launched into gold and purple sky like the sun's first flash breaking from the east, his fingers uncurling slowly from a clenched fist. Okay, my most recent book, and probably, Diane, I should have sent you some copies of the book, I didn't think about it, um, is The Coolest Month. Let me bring up that cover. And that's it. Um, <clears throat> um, these are poems that are um, that are that were written during the month of April sometime in the last I don't know 11 years uh, I started doing this program in, in uh, 2012 um, so I, uh, in, in April where I write a poem a day. Right? Lots of people across the world do this in April. And I get uh, prompts, poetry prompts from two places, from naporimo.net. Naporimo stands for National Poetry Writing Month. And uh, 
So every day in April, Napo Rimo puts out a suggestion for, for a poem to write. And then there's another, um, the, the magazine Writer's Digest uh, has a blog called Write Better Poetry that also produces prompts uh, every every day in April. So what I try to do is to write a poem each day based on both of those prompts, okay? Um, and then the poems look like this. So it says uh, April 1st, right? That's the first poem. And then uh, here's April 2nd, you know, and so on. So there's 30 poems in this book. Each of them were written on a particular day, you know, whatever day they're on is the day that they were written sometime between 2012 and 2019 when the book was published. Okay. <clears throat> so this first poem, April 1st, um, is titled, April is the cruelest month, or hoping 30 new poems will arrive. The book is called The Coolest Month because the poet T.S. Eliot in a, in a famous poem wrote that April is the cruelest month. And, uh, and so I'm, I'm, I'm playing, uh, playing with that. Um, the two prompts that day <coughs> the two prompts that day came from uh, the uh, um, Write Better Poetry prompt was a poem, a write an arrival poem. And then the other, the Naporimo, uh, Naporimo um, prompt was write a poem that has the same first line as another poem. And so I cheated because I used uh, um, Eliot's uh, April is the Cruelest Month as my title, though um, 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 the first word is the same as, as his first word, which is the word April. And this is a um, an abecedarian. You can see that every word starts with, uh, the, with the alphabet. So it's A, B, C, all down, all one word per line. So you can listen for the A, B, C. I'll try to read it slowly. April is the cruelest month or hoping 30 new poems will arrive. April's blood curdling damnable expectation for gorgeous Homeric iambics just kills limp noodled me. No old pantoums, casitas, rondos, senryu, terzanels, ugh, verse. Well, Xbox, Yu-Gi-Oh, Zoloft. So in the middle, I should have told you in the middle, there's a list of different poetry type, poem types. And uh, and at the end, there's kind of a small list, Xbox, Yu-Gi-Oh, Zoloft. These are things I could write about, right? Uh, but it's a poem, a little bit of an anxious poem about, you know, is it going to be possible to write 30 poems? So that was uh, written on April 1st, uh, 2013. All right. Can somebody uh, uh, give me a date in April and I'll read the poem for that date? In April, like a uh, family birthday, something, or anniversary of something, or just any date. <laughs> the 20th. 20th, okay, April 20th. Ah, okay. In April 20th, the, the prompts for that day were, one, write a family poem, which I love to do. I write a lot of family poems. And then two, write a poem in the voice of a member of your family. So by that, it just so happened, that was the April 20th, 2014. Just so happened that on that day, those two prompts coincided exactly, right? Because they both had to do with family. And so this is a poem called Gerardo, my dead brother speaks. And Herard, my my uh, when I was a, when I was about, I think maybe two years old, um, my mom was was pregnant, and uh, the baby was born premature. And this was this would have been 1954, and so um, 
you know, I think we're a lot better off these days with medical technology to to uh, to help uh, premature babies live longer, right, or or, or survive, you know, to, to uh, and and so my my uh, my younger brother was um, was in um, in an incubator for a week, but but didn't survive, and and when I was when I was Anyway, at, at some point shortly after that, um, my my mom and dad we were at home, and my mom and dad heard wings fl flapping inside the house, but couldn't find couldn't find it, couldn't find what the source was, and and meanwhile, there's a little two year old me, and I'm like pointing, and I said Ado Ado, which is how I I, I could the only way I could pronounce uh, my brother Gerardo's name. I said, Ado, Ado, and then pointed like this, right? Uh, 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 as if some tracing, you know, as if I was pointing at something flying out, out the window. All right. So this is Gerardo, my dead brother speaks. I have been your guardian angel, brother, for the last 60 years, protecting you from mishap and danger. Yes, those winks were me. Those winks heard by you and by our mother and father that time when you were only two. You called Ado, Ado, identifying me correctly. We have been together ever since because the Lord assigned me to be your keeper. When the car missed you when you were six, all those other times, because of me, you lived. My motto all your life has been simply one word. We, always we. So that was a way I had, you know, I mean, I, I obviously didn't know my my little brother, because uh, I was so little when he was born, but I was sort of imagining a way for him to be in my life, you know, to be for us to be together. Um, all right, how about another day, another date? Thirtieth. What? I'm sorry. The thirtieth. Let me save that for the end. Uh, that'll be the last poem from the book. How about another one? Sorry. The ten. The 10th, okay. We're going in, in multiples of 10 here, all right. Um, oh, okay. So April 10th of <clears throat> 2017, the two prompts were, write a poem that is a portrait of someone important to you. The other one was write a travel poem. And I remembered, um, so, Remember that was 2017, so we were really a year, a little over a year into the into the Trump presidency at that point, and I remembered that my mother, as when I was a kid, my mother was always afraid to go to Mexico. When I I really wanted to go to Mexico when I was a kid, just you know, just as a tourist, and <clears throat> and my mom was afraid that that we would get into Mexico and then she would not be allowed to come back, you know, because, well, she's brown, right? I mean, I'm brown. And, uh, and I really thought at the time, you know, being an American kid, you know, I thought, oh, you know, that could never happen, right? Um, all right. <clears throat> so you keep in mind that, 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 you know, what's happening at the border these days. Uh, all right, my mother's fear. My mother was an alien a legal alien, that is, she had a green card, while my father and I were the family's U.S. citizens. As a kid, I wanted to visit Mexico, but my mother was afraid. Now, she was a brave woman, a doctor, the only female in her med school class during a time when only men could do such things. But for her, no Mexico. She was scared they would stop her at the border on the way back and she would get stranded alone. I thought that was foolish and silly, I remember. How could that happen? America was the land of the free. Well, mama, today you'd be right. America great again. You were always right. Um, yeah. Um, okay. Well, let me read the, the, the poem for April 30th. Uh, then I'll read a couple others. Um, so this is a poem called All Zombies Coming and Going. Oh, let me read the, 
April 30th, 2015. One prompt was write a poem backwards. Start with the last line and work your way up to the pay up the page to the beginning. And then the other one was take the phrase bury the blank, replace the blank with a word or phrase, and make the new phrase the title of your poem. The poem, so my poem was initially titled Bury the Zombies. I um oh wait, my computer's dying. Hang on. Okay. Wouldn't that be terrible if my computer died in the middle of this thing? <laughs> Jeez. Um <laughs> I'm I'm a uh I'm a Walking Dead fan and I I, I just love everything zombie, which is might seem odd to some people, but um um and uh and so this poem was inspired by that. And I'm calling this a somersault abecedarian. It, it's also a poem, you know, that's ABC. But the way that it's written, let me see if I can show you. The way that it's written, the first column is ABC going down all the way to Z, right? Z. And then I can't, okay, wait. And then the other side is the same words going backwards, Z, Y, X, right? All the way to the, the exact same words. The only difference is the punctuation uh, on, on either side. And uh, so I'll read the first column down and then read the second column. And again, I can, I'll try to read it slowly so that you can um, hear the A, B, C and then the Z, Y, X. All right. <clears throat> All bury caskets, dooms exhausted, forever green, horrific, inside jujubes, kissing lips, miniature, never oblique, planned quiet reveries, secure trees, under visible wound, exit your zipper. Zipper your, so this is the other side, zipper your exit wound, visible under trees, secure reveries, quiet, Plan oblique, never miniature lips, kissing jujubes inside horrific green, forever exhausted, dooms caskets, bury all. Okay, so that's that book, uh, The Coolest Month. And lately I've been working on, uh, on a book of poems that, um, hang on a second. I got my tablet here and I'm gonna, I need to. Okay, uh, I'm, I've been writing a book of poems that's a novel, actually a story of about two monsters, two Philippine monsters called Aswang. Uh, and Aswang are different kinds of monsters. And so the woman in this, oh, I need to change the, the picture. The woman in the, in the story is a Mananangal. And, and here's a little drawing of mine. Of um, the, the, the Mananangal can separate herself, split herself at the, at the hips right here. Right, uh, and the top half can fly off, can grow wings and fly off, and you know do what they ever they do in the night, uh, <laughs> which are awful monsterly things. Right, her uh, lover and husband uh, is uh, her lover and then husband is a shapeshifter. He uh, can can turn into a giant dog. He's a were dog. In the Philippines, they don't have wolves, and so they have were dogs instead of werewolves. Um, and what happens is in the in the novel, what happens is the the um, the uh, Clara, who is the 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 woman, she's a vampire, you know, and, and the the, the self splitting person uh, monster. Um, is discovered by her neighbors to be an Aswang because they're all Aswang in the Philippines um, by legend, right? 
uh, during the day, they're just regular people. And then at night, they turn into monsters. And and so what that means is that anyone around you could be an Aswan, right? And uh, so anyway, she's discovered by her neighbors and, you know, they try to kill her. And her hu her husband, or not yet husband, her, her boyfriend at the time, um, Santiago, uh, saves her. And then they... they uh, they leave the Philippines and go to the U.S. because the Philippines, it, the, the, the story is set in 1937 when the Philippines was still part of the U.S. And so there, that I, I did that on purpose to be able to bring them to so that they, it would be easy for them to come to come to the U.S. Um, and um, they happen to come on the day that that. Um, well, the Golden Gate was was uh, completed in May of 1937. The Golden Gate Bridge, I should say, and it uh, on May 26th, people were allowed to walk across. The bridge had not been had not been opened yet, and people were allowed to walk across the bridge. Uh, and this was a place where no one had ever been able to to uh, to cross before because it was um, uh, you know it was a uh, a really forbidding kind of location where um, not even ferry boats could cross there. Uh, and so this was quite an amazing thing for San Franciscans to be able to walk across that bridge. And then the next day there was a dedication of the bridge. Okay. Um, and at the time that, that, uh, that, or the day rather that day uh, when people walked across the bridge was the day that, uh, that uh, Clara and and Santiago, who had who had been married shortly before that, uh, uh, arrive uh, in San Francisco. All right, this is called Aswang Honeymoon at the Golden Gate, May 26, 1937. Isn't that simply magnificent, Tiago? Clara pointed above the steamship's prow as they sailed under the brand new bridge its orange towers gleaming in the setting sun. Tiago could only nod, speechless at the beauty of the orange cables, shimmering as they swooped in a graceful arc. Thousands of San Franciscans had walked across the Golden Gate that day, a grand feat never before possible. Clara and Tiago hurried but got to the bridge too late, almost dark. The next morning at the dedication, people snickered at the loony old man, the bridge watchman, who swore he'd heard leathery wings, walk, walk, and saw silhouetted against the moon, a bizarre flying thing holding a gigantic dog. Holding a dog? Nearby listeners laughed, pantomiming drinking from a bottle behind the poor man's back. Crazy drunk, they whispered to each other, smirking. How beautiful it must have been on top of the 800-foot tower nearest to the glistening lights of San Francisco, tiny diamonds strewn on jet black cloth, the bride's wings beating slow and soft, the groom's canine fur shining sable and sleek, holding hand and paw in the velvet night, a thousand stars showering glittery light. Okay, I think that's it, Diane. Um, uh, we can do questions if you want. Or I was going to ask about uh, you. You were recently nominated for a, a prize for a publication of, of uh, sci-fi poetry. Oh yeah, yeah. Uh, if you have any of those poems, you could. You know, I I can. One second, let me. You, you, it was, it was two, you had two poems on the list, didn't you? Um, one poem that was nominated. One poem, okay. Okay, let me see if I can find it. Okay. Okay, I'm going to share a screen. Let 
Can you can you guys see that screen? So this is in a magazine called Ida the Telescope. And it is the Science Fiction and Fantasy Poetry Association um, the online journal of that association. And this was in an issue called Veterans of Future Wars. Um, and uh, every issue has a particular theme. And so that was the theme, Veterans of Future Wars. And then my poem is about 10 poems down here. Hang on. Old soldier, new love. Again, an abecedarian. So there's the A, B, and C, and you can you can read it. Um, aliens fought them when I was younger. Bug hunt. That's what we used to say. Carapace and stick legs, green ooze for blood. Damned if they didn't just swarm all over us. Every man jack sometimes, and we would fire the lasers embedded in our arms, full auto. Giant cockroaches, six feet tall, chittering and hissing. The cybernetic mecha vision and radar implanted in our foreheads used to light up just like fireworks within our freaking brains. Killing, killing, killing. No end to it, it felt like. The war ended, strangely enough, with men, women, and aliens in diplomatic councils. Never thought the damn bugs could even talk. Over time, we were brought back to Earth, but... Uh, we were brought back to Earth, the prosthetic armaments extracted. The weird quiet in my brain then was unnerving, empty reverberations and echoes. I went crazy for some time, could not even interact, could not interact or even just talk with anybody. Every civilian felt to me unfamiliar, unknowable, like aliens. I was very much alone till I met an amazing, lovely woman. Well, not exactly, not a human, but a xenomorph like the enemy back in the war. You won't believe how smart and cute she is. Zukola Mia, she's called, and I love her. Okay, so that's that's that poem. Um, part of one of your um, collections? Or is, 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 is I'm sorry? Is that part of a future collection or just? Yeah, that'll be in a future collection. Um, I'm working on a collection now called Dragons and Ray Guns, which is all science fiction and fantasy poems. So that'll be in that book. Uh, that's, you know, sometime in the future. I actually have a version of that book that, that's out trying to get published as a chap book, which is a, a small collection of, of poems. And I have maybe 25 of those poems and it might become a full book eventually. Anything else? Thank you, Vince. I'm going to stop the recording. Okay, thank you. Sure. Thanks, Thanks for coming, everybody. Thank you.